Welcome. Uh, just a couple of notes before I get into uh, the lesson for, for today. Uh, what I've put together here is an audio track to go with uh, the lesson that I would have been giving in class. Uh, I'll try to go as quickly as I can so I don't waste too, too much of your time. But what I do want to do with each of these lessons that I post uh, is just to provide a little bit more background uh, on what we would have been discussing uh, and to try to elaborate and sort of talk about some of the key points um, from the discussions. Uh, as usual, um, I will post uh, versions of the lesson both in Word format, so if you want to follow along and keep notes, if that helps, you'll have that there. Um, I'll also provide a uh, template uh, in terms of the PowerPoint, so if you'd prefer to just keep that for review or, or sort of to just look through, uh, that's also fine. Um, don't forget that there will be some homework. Um, I usually put the homework uh, for regular sorts of lessons like this one um, at the end of the note, so just make sure that you do do that. Um, everything will be posted each day uh, in terms of day-to-day -day type lessons uh, underneath a title on Edspan. So the, the, the organizational system will essentially just be the feed um, and just try to follow along in order. If you follow chronologically, um, according to the dates that are listed, um, you should be able to pretty easily make your way from uh, through the lessons from week to week. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about conformity and obedience. Uh, and this is actually um, a lesson which picks up Unit 4, which we began um, at the later parts of uh, February, in the latter parts of February and early March. Uh, you'll recall that uh, during those weeks, we talked a little bit about group behavior and how groups impact people's thinking. Uh, we also talked a little bit about not just what we call conformity, where people adjust their behavior actions to fit in with a group, but we discussed uh, an important psychological concept referred to as groupthink. Uh, and essentially, uh, and I'm sure you'll recall, groupthink not only involves people uh, engaging in conformity, but often doing so in an irrational way, where they follow along with the actions of a group, um, but they don't necessarily think clearly about what they're doing um, and whether or not uh, it's something that's wise or, 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 or uh, sensible. Uh, we we also looked at a couple of famous case studies of that phenomenon. Of course, we talked about the Manson family and those famous murders that occurred in 1969. Uh, and we saw how those women, obviously, uh, who were involved in those particular crimes were really sort of brainwashed into what they were doing um, by not just uh, Charles Manson, but also sort of the world around them. Uh, and then we also looked at the tragic tale of Jonestown, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is one of the you know more famous examples of all time. Uh, in terms of group think. Um, where we're going to be going over the next couple of weeks, uh, there will be periodic breaks uh, where certain weeks, uh, at least two of them will be working on the ISP. Um, but otherwise, we're going to continue and finish up this look at group behavior by looking at a couple of concepts. Uh, this week, and I've already talked about it, so I'll just quickly sort of review, we're going to be looking at conformity and obedience. We'll also talk a little bit about just the whole idea of experimentation and why it's important, um, but also why it has dangers. Uh, in about two weeks' time, so the week before Easter, we'll be looking a little bit at um, the prison system. Um, prison system is obviously an important issue. It's certainly an important uh, group setting within society. Um, it's also a really challenging one that involves a lot of important questions in terms of um, the environment and sort of the impact on people, both psychologically and sociologically. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll look at some case studies uh, and we'll talk about some of the, not just philosophies that go into prison, but also some of the practical challenges that exist in a country like Canada. Um, final uh, sort of couple of lessons we'll look at at the latter part or in the latter part of April. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we call in and out groups and do a few examples of that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about poverty and social inequality, which is a huge, huge issue, um, really in some respects, uh, created sort of the impetus for sociology uh, in its earliest days in the 19th century. And then finally, we'll finish up with some uh, interesting looks at um, uh, an ever-present and important topic, topic which is bullying. Uh, key dates, uh, again, some of this is up in the air. There is a journal tomorrow. Okay, so when you finish this lesson, if you want to push ahead to that, you can. Uh, if you want to do the video lesson for uh, the end of this week and then go back and do the journal, that's also fine. Just make sure that that journal is completed and into me um, by uh, the end of the week. Um, the other thing that you will be working on next week is the ISP. And again, I talked about in the film that you've already seen. Uh, as far as this particular lesson material and how it will be actually evaluated in the end, uh, that's very much to be determined. 
if we get back to school, it's just two weeks, which is probably very optimistic thinking, but you never know. Um, we may end up doing a test most likely later April at this point. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have to put a few other sorts of things together. Uh, we may end up just doing a few more smaller journal type activities and not having tests. Uh, that's probably more likely, but again, um, we'll see. Just make sure you are doing the work though, because you never know if you may end up having to sort of refer to it uh, in, in some kind of more summative assessment uh, format. And probably there will be something along those lines, uh, more details of which will come. Okay, uh, before March break, we talked about Jonestown. Uh, it was kind of an eerie sort of way to end our series of lessons there. We saw how uh, there had been these people who had been brought into the People's Temple, which started out as a church uh, in the United States, and gradually became more or less a, a cult following. Uh, and they eventually moved down to uh, Guyana, uh, and eventually, uh, one day, as we saw chaos happened, uh, their leader made a very dramatic request that they were going to have to move and transition to the next world by drinking cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. Uh, and almost every single person, uh, man, woman, child, uh, who was there, 900 or more, they drank this Kool-Aid. Uh, and for years afterwards, one of the questions that people asked was, well, why did this happen? What caused it to occur? Um, there's lots of uh, debate about why people, uh, I guess, drank the Kool-Aid. It's, it's an overused statement, but it comes from Jonestown. Why did people sort of follow along and, and drink this poison? Um, certainly, it's not a singular answer, um, but one of the more certain answers for that has to do with a concept which we've discussed, which is conformity. Um, conformity, of course, as you'll recall, uh, it involves people changing their behavior attitudes to fit with those of a group. Uh, it has to do with the psychological need for acceptance. Um, oftentimes people conform because they want to sort of fit in, they want to sort of be part of a group. Um, it is important to note though that it also is something that's universal. It's not just particular to one culture or one group of people. Um, it happens for all groups of people in all parts of the world at all time. Um, one of the other final points that's interesting, and this is gonna connect in a little bit with the particular new directions we're going with this lesson, uh, conformity may also involve uh, an element of uh, following a leader, okay? And oftentimes when you're looking at people who conform, they may be conforming because they're particularly persuaded by the group above them. And there's certain things that they're trying to achieve by following either a directive or at least just the actions uh, of that person in the leadership position. Um, when you have people uh, who are being swayed, not just by the group around them, but by particular um, people with power within that group, and where the power dynamic is motivating a person to act a certain way, uh, we're dealing with a certain kind of conformity, which is what we call obedience. Um, and obedience is essentially an important psychological phenomenon that occurs when a powerful member of a group gains power or control over other people. Um, you might want to pause here and think about it. I'm going to go through some of the answers that students often provide in a second. But what I wanted you to think about here is why is it that people obey? Uh, what kinds of factors might cause a person to obey either a small group or perhaps just the directives of one person uh, with power authority over them? So I'll pause for a second. You may want to pause, may want to make a couple of notes, just a little sort of scrap piece of paper. Okay, and now we'll go on. Um, there's lots of reasons why people might obey. Um, just a few of them, uh, again, that have come up in the past. Uh, sometimes people may obey because there's a desire for gaining popularity. Uh, they desire to be a part of the group. They want to sort of fit in. They want to, I said sort of, I'm trying not to do that. They want to uh, be you know, a part of things. Um, another reason is it may not be sort of a pull, but it may actually be sort of a fear of consequence. Uh, when a person is in a setting wherein they're in a situation where somebody has power, that power may actually have the ability to create consequence. And it may well be that a person doesn't really agree with what they're doing, but the fear of not going along is enough to actually motivate them. Um, a third point is the fact that some people um, may just not want to have to 
be the one to stand against an authority uh, figure. And so a shyness or maybe sort of an apprehension may actually be uh, the sort of motivation for why they're going along. It's easier to go along than to actually sort of stand against. Um, sometimes, and I think this is true for all of us in certain moments, it could just be an apathy. Um, you might see a situation where, you know, you're in class and your teacher says, can you please, uh, you know, do whatever, I, I, fill in the blank, and you don't really care, so you say fine. Because the you know the, the the argument and the debate that comes from not doing what you've been asked to do is just not worth it. You just don't really care. Fine, I'll do what I'm asked. Um, and then finally, sometimes uh, you may actually do it because, and this is a dangerous situation. Uh, you may obey because you actually believe the person who has authority um, knows what they're asking, and they and they have a good reason for why they're asking you to do things. Uh, and if you implicitly just believe in that person. Uh, and their message has got through to you enough over time that you trust them, then you may feel like, well, I, this is not an action I want to do myself, but in this particular case, that trust is going to lead me into a position where I'll take a chance uh, and I'll follow their command. Think about like a player on a sports team. You may have a coach that you just really, really respect, and they say, I want you to do this, and you might think, well, that's not sensible that goes against my best judgment but the trust factor may be strong enough that if they've built that up you're more likely to follow uh, a command even in circumstances where it goes against your uh, general uh, sense of, uh, of what you should be doing um, when you're looking at obedience uh, obedience as we've mentioned and, and hopefully those answers make sense to you um, it's not an exhaustive list by the way there's lots more than just these things uh, but one of the key things that's worth noting is that obedience happens uh, not only for many reasons but it also happens with varying levels of commitment uh, when you think about that list that we just made some of the time when people are being obedient they really believe in what they're doing and sometimes they just don't really care but there's other things that are sort of pushing them forward. Um, when we're talking about the level of obedience people have, you can often sort of break things down into different sorts of levels or scales. Um, the first and the simplest, it's the most common, would be compliance. And essentially what you're looking at when people are obedient due to compliance is that they really just don't want punishment, they don't want to stand out, uh, they may disagree even with what they're doing, um, but they will publicly go along with the majority just to avoid conflict or controversy. Um, your second type of obedience is a little bit more sort of personal in the sense that you may actually want to be a part of the group. And while you may have some reservations about what you're asked to do, and you may not, but you often will, you'll, you'll go along a little bit more regularly, not because you're trying to avoid anything, but rather because you want to be part. Um, you know, you put you put a uniform on and you want to be a part of that team and you'll act in a certain way in order to fit in with the others. Um, your final level of obedience is the most um, substantial in terms of just the motivation, and that's internalization. Uh, and when it comes to internalization, essentially what's happening is that you are thinking the way the group does, often in a sense, just because you become a part of them. Um, you don't even really think for yourself anymore. You just go with the group because you've internalized their message so much that what they're doing almost becomes intricately connected with what you do. You do what the group does because that's just who you are. You're one of them. Uh, when you look at things like Jonestown, or if you look at the Manson family and sort of the control that Charles Manson had over those people, uh, the people in those circumstances were not just being compliant or identifying, they actually had internalized the message. Um, and they reached the level of obedience, which was actually in many respects quite dangerous because they'd lost the ability to really think critically about other alternatives. Uh, we're gonna be looking for the next few minutes at an important uh, study that was done in the 1960s. Uh, the person who you'll see there, and this is his sort of 1960s incarnation, um, obviously, as he gets older, he sort of moves out of that, um, I, I guess, phase. Uh, it was Stanley Milgram. Uh, Stanley Milgram was a psychologist at Yale University. Uh, and in 1961 and 1962, and he did experiments really throughout his life. He's a very, very famous guy. But in 1961 and 1962, he did an experiment that became one of the most famous psychological experiments of all time. And it really helped for him to make a mark and for his university to gain a lot of credit as well. Um, it was an important date. Uh, if you don't know very much about history, uh, in 1961 or two, one of those two years, 
uh, the Israeli government had actually sent agents into Argentina. Um, there was a former Nazi whose name was Adolf Eichmann who had fled after World War II. Um, Eichmann had been one of the key architects of the concentration camps and had been really one of the top Nazis who, who they hadn't uh, been able to bring to justice but always had. Um, they found that he was kind of, uh, I think he was working at a tire factory for Goodyear or something like that, but he'd been living um, on a ranch in Argentina. Argentina had kind of turned a blind eye to the fact that he was there. Um, and so controversially, uh, Israel actually sent uh, agents from Mossad to Argentina, they abducted him, and they brought him back to Israel where he faced trial. And then eventually he was convicted and executed for his role within the Holocaust. Um, why is this important? Why does this link with sort of Stanley uh, Milgram? Well, Milgram was trying to look at um, people and their obedience. And one of the key questions that people for years had asked is, how had people like Eichmann been able to get so many underlings within the Nazi party and people within Germany to follow along with really what were horrific requests, you know, essentially um, asking people to follow along with a process that led to the deaths of over 6 million Jewish people uh, and almost 7 million just general people uh, in Europe. Um, it, it was a really important psychological question, and it certainly was one that was motivating a lot of Milgram's research. He wanted to know why would this happen and what kinds of people could be prone to sort of this behavior. Uh, was it just people who were naturally evil, or was there maybe something a little bit more uh, subtle but sinister uh, behind things? Uh, the experiment that he ran led to a number of shocking findings, and we'll talk about that at the end. Um, but it was also an important experiment because while it was really, really meaningful, um, it, it faced a lot of ethical questions uh, over the long run. And a lot of people felt like they were maybe uh, ethical lines that Milgram crossed in order to prove his uh, findings. Okay, and we'll debate that a little bit at the end. So let's talk a little bit about the experiment. We'll start by just talking about how it was set up. Uh, Milgram wanted to run the experiment using volunteers, and he wanted just random people who lived uh, within American society. And so he put together um, an advertisement. And in the advertisement, which was in the newspaper, and you can see that here on the left, or sorry, the right of your screen, um, he said, I'll give you $4 for one hour of your time. Um, now, $4 in 1960s is equivalent to about $37 today. So essentially, if a person had an afternoon off, maybe it was a day where they didn't have to work and they were, you know, they, they were bored, um, they were offered, here's $40, come in, do an hour worth of work, go home, and you'll help me to learn something very interesting. Uh, when, the, when the volunteers arrived at Milgram's lab, uh, they were told that they were going to be helping to run an experiment designed uh, to study the effects of punishment on learning. And so they were told that they would be uh, participants who would help with the administration of this particular study. Now, how is the study going to work? Well, I'll go over this a little bit here, and I'll, I'll show you some visuals as well in a second. Uh, in particular, the volunteers who came in were told they were going to be teachers. So all of the people who were volunteers were teachers. Uh, they were paired up with another group of volunteers who he deemed in another way called learners. And they were a smaller group that I guess he, 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 he'd um, previously brought together. Uh, what the teacher was going to have to do as a volunteer was as follows. Uh, they were going to show a series of words to the learner. Uh, and they were word pairs, so it might be dog and cat and rain and sunshine, just random sorts of words, but words that were meant to pair up and that hopefully the person could learn um, through a process of being read these pairs and hopefully trying to memorize. Um, once that process had been done, the teacher would then test out the learner and how much they had learned. Uh, essentially, the learner was set up uh, in another room and they're strapped to an electric chair. Uh, there were electrodes that were connected to their arms, and I'll show you the picture in a second. Um, they were connected uh, to that device, and then they were put into a room where you couldn't see into the room, but you could at least hear them through a microphone system. So if there was a problem, um, the person could yell out and there would be a microphone and you'd hear it. In fact, this picture right here is kind of an, uh, an outline of what that room would look like. Once that person who was the learner was set up in that room, the teacher then had a job. Uh, Milgram would read out a series of words and he would read out uh, the pair as well. The person who is the learner would have to tell what word went with the word that Milgram read out based on the pairings that they've been taught. If the person got an answer correct, then the teacher's role was essentially just to say, okay, that's fine, and do nothing. However, if the learner was in a situation where they got an answer incorrect, then the teacher had a bit of a challenging job in that they had to administer 
an electric shock to the person in the chair. Uh, the shocks were designed to start at 15 volts, which probably would be like almost nothing. You wouldn't really feel it. It would tickle maybe a bit. Um, they were then going to go up on a machine, and I'll show you the machine in a second, that went all the way to a 450 volts. And 450 volts was labeled on this machine, which you can see here the person who's the teacher would be pushing uh, as danger uh, XXX, something along those lines. It, it was clearly indicated that it would be painful and, and damaging. Um, you would only go up each time an answer was wrong, but every time a person got an answer wrong, you would have to go up and give a higher level shock. Uh, and so hopefully that makes sense, but that was basically the procedure. And you would go through the list of words and see how far the person could go and how they would, I guess, uh, deal with the potential for punishment. Uh, shocks, as I mentioned, were 15 volts. Okay, they went up to 450. Um, the final point, and I've mentioned this as well, but I'll review, uh, both rooms were on an intercom. And so the idea was that you couldn't see this person, but if there's some kind of issue, they could tell you. And you, plus the man in the white coat who would take on sort of the authority role uh, as the experiment runner, would at least know, okay, is there, is there a concern? Is there a reason to maybe get involved here? Um, there you can see a picture of the man who was the learner. And it was usually uh, the same person each time. Um, and he's being hooked up to an electrode. And you can see uh, the uh, administrator in the white coat is the person who would have been reading the, the, the words and things out. He's setting up that sort of system. And there's an aide there helping him. Um, and then once that's done, the person in the white coat would sit right here, would read out the questions. Uh, you as the teacher would be the aide pushing the electric shocks every time there was an answer wrong and going up in terms of scale each time. And you can see this here as well in terms of the scales going up each time with a more and more uh, dangerous or, or, or heavy um, voltage shock each time the person who is the learner got an answer wrong. Okay, and so it was a pretty complicated experiment and obviously one that was a little bit challenging for the person who was a teacher. And there again, you can see sort of the idea of things. Um, keep in mind that the uh, person who was getting the shocks would have been separated um, and you couldn't see them compared to these two people right here. And there you can see the machine. And this is an actual picture of the uh, voltage uh, machine that the person would have to use. Okay, and you'll notice that at the end it says intense. It actually goes much further until eventually it's XXX uh, shock. All right, question. We're going to talk about what happened in a second, but I want you to think about this. What do you think was the purpose of the Milgram experiment? Uh, from the perspective of the testers, the people who are pushing those shock buttons, uh, and the person who's in the room with the white coat looking at sort of the experiment and running it, what knowledge might they have gained by applying shocks to the learners in that situation? Think about it. Maybe pause. Okay, we'll move on. Um, the reality is that the true purpose of the experiment was uh, a little bit camouflaged from the person who was the teacher. On the surface, it seemed like you were trying to look at what would happen if punishment occurred. Would punishment motivate people to become more successful or maybe through a series of creating you know, new, new nervous uh, or, or creating nerves in the person taking the test, uh, make them actually answer incorrectly with greater frequency? The reality, though, was that that wasn't what was happening, okay? And it couldn't have actually happened because I'll give you a little bit of a hint here. Uh, if you gave a person a 450-volt shock, you would kill them immediately. So they couldn't hook a person up to a shock meter that would kill them. Stanley Milgram wasn't about to start killing learners in the sake of, um, you know, studying obedience. Uh, what was actually happening was that the people who were being tested were not the people in the chair. It was always the same man in the chair. He wasn't actually being shocked at all. When the experiment would be run, he would get out of the chair um, and hook up a microphone and hook up a tape recorder that had a pre-recorded series of responses um, that had been recorded for how he might have been answering. Uh, who was being tested was actually, and we'll go back to the graph here, this person. The tester, the, the person who thought they were doing the experiment with the experiment leader. Uh, and the question that was being asked was, how far would they go, particularly if you could show uh, that the people who are being punished, uh, the learners, were actually starting to see signs of pain um, and discomfort? How far would that person go if told by the person beside them in the white coat running the experiment that it was okay with those shocks, knowing that there was somebody on the other end on the microphone saying, I'm not sure I want to do this. Uh, is this something that's okay? Uh, when the experiment began, 
it, the, the results were, were scary. Uh, the learner started by getting most answers correct. So at the beginning, it wasn't too big a deal. Uh, most of the answers were correct. The person who was the learner was getting them. You had to give a few shocks, but they're kind of mild. And you might have heard the person on the other line say, oh, oh, it, but nothing really big. Uh, when you started to actually get into the range of shocks, though, over 100 volts, um, you started to see, and again, this was all pre-recorded, the person who was the learner offering up more signs of discomfort. So they would say things along the lines of, ow, or they might say, hey, did you know I have heart problems? Get me out of this room. Uh, and the question was, as these people started to show concern, as the person who was the learner, would you as the tester keep going so long as you had a calm man in a white coat, it was always the same person, telling you it's important, we need to go on, the experiment requires that you give these shocks. Um, the learners at a certain point actually started to groan. Um, some of them actually started to scream out in pain. In fact, it was always the same recording, but the, the, there would be screams as you started to go into the 200 and 300 volts. And if you made it up to 350, 400, eventually you got to a point where, in fact, there would be nothing heard, uh, which again would indicate that maybe the person had passed out or was just no longer able or uh, capable as a learner of actually responding to the pain that was being given. Um, in this particular situation, uh, you might think that people would have trouble getting to a point where there was significant pain being shown by the person who was the learner, at least the theoretical learner. Um, the reality, though, was not so. Okay, and you can see here, these are different people. Um, here are some of the different uh, tested um, individuals in terms of testers, but, but, but really the ones who are being tested. Uh, they didn't all show, you know, joy with shocking these people. Um, in fact, in many cases, they actually were very, very concern, but in most cases, and I'll give you the statistics in a second, in most cases, when they were told to go on, they would eventually go on, and over half the people would have shocked the person to a point where they would have actually uh, not only experienced pain, but in fact, if it had been real, actually experienced death. Um, here you can see the specific numbers. 65% uh, of the volunteers shocked all the way up to 450 volts, uh, despite the pleas and then eventually the silence after those pleas of the person on the end of the shock machine. Uh, more than 75% of the people applied one shock uh, to the person after they'd complained about a weak heart and all of the volunteers uh, continued after the first cry of discomfort. So every single one of those people who came in there as testers would have shocked the person when they were uncomfortable, and the majority would have actually shocked them to a position of severe pain, or in 65% of the cases, what would have actually, if it had been real, death. Um, to Milgram, this was clear evidence that if you put a person in the right circumstances, even if they had a good heart, and he was trying to show that not all people who do awful things are necessarily awful people, but if you put them in the right circumstances, they may actually have the capacity to harm people. Uh, and that was frightening. Um, what ex uh, important experiment conclusions were, were drawn from this? Well, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, what does it suggest about human behavior? Do the results frighten you? Milgram's conclusion was essentially that when we talk about people, and this links back to the uh, Holocaust, like Nazis, and we say they're all just monsters, they all must have been born monsters, that may be overly simplistic. Uh, and that the reality is that we all, or at least huge numbers of us, have within our selves the ability to do really awful things if you put us in a circumstance where we think what we're doing is fine and we're told not to worry by a person we assume knows what's best um people were terrified by these results because it showed just how capable people might have been of something that they never would have probably declared if you'd asked them just on their own that they could have done um now a second question was the experiment ethical well think about it um, it was an important experiment, and you couldn't tell these people who were in the teacher's chair what was happening, because if they knew it was happening, you, the results wouldn't be real. Uh, but for the people who left those chairs, while the results were very, very meaningful, um, there was a challenge. Uh, they'd been lied to. They hadn't been told what they were going to actually have to go through. Uh, and for a lot of them, the knowledge that they would have actually killed the person was very, very hard to deal with. Um, and many people had actually argued that to put a person in a position of that psychological stress uh, was perhaps unethical. Uh, different people have different perspectives. Um, certainly nobody had been uh, physically harmed in the experiment, but at an emotional level, there's always been questions about was Milgram going too far? Uh, my own personal opinion, um, I, I don't actually myself think he went too far. 
Um, this is just me t speaking here. I, I kind of feel, and I always have felt like, given that there was no physical um, sort of sort of um, injury, um, and given that the results were so important, it was a worthwhile sort of ruse. Um, but certainly, I think, and I think a lot of people as well would acknowledge, it was pretty close to those lines. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people, including some of you, may actually believe that the experiment well went well over, rather, uh, the lines of what's permissible. Um, I've got a little bit of a video here, which I'm going to play, which talks about the experiment and puts it into context. Uh, you can watch this here. It's playing off the system audio. So uh, if it doesn't work out so well, I'll also pose a link to it uh, or post a link to it with your entry for today. Uh, but for now, I'll just play it. In a unique period from the early 60s to the early 70s, a group of social scientists conducted a series of experiments examining the nature of human behavior and its relationship to social conventions and situations. In this setting, I allow things to be done to me that I wouldn't allow in any other context. The dentist is about to put an electric drill into my mouth. In this setting, I willingly expose my throat to a man with a razor blade. Stanley Milgram, one of the most influential social psychologists of the time, was particularly fascinated with the dangers of group behavior and blind obedience to authority. What is there in human nature? that allows an individual to act without any restraints whatsoever so that he can act uh, inhumanely, harshly, severely, and in no way limited by feelings of compassion or conscience. These are questions... But might... he might be dead in there. The experiment requires that you continue. 330 volts. The experiments that Milgram and others conducted were controversial and, for ethical reasons, may never be conducted again. Yet the results of those experiments remain groundbreaking, profoundly revealing about the tensions between the individual and society, and increasingly relevant to contemporary life. In 1962, Stanley Milgram shocked the world with his study on obedience. To test his theories, he invented an event that would become a window into human cruelty. In ascending order, a row of buttons marked the amount of voltage one person would inflict upon another. Milgram's original motive for the experiment was to understand the unthinkable, how the German people could permit the extermination of the Jews. When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. The problem I wanted to study was a little different, it went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher, All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the... Uh, up so that he can get some sort of punishment. What inspired Milgram, I would say there were a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment that he could think of. Can you roll up your right sleeve, please? This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. Do you have any questions now before we go to the next room? About two years ago, I was at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. 
and nothing serious. But as long as I'm having these shocks, uh, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please, in the next room? Mm -hmm. But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experiment. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts, and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, Intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally XXX, danger severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is a word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts. And you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105. Hard hit. Just how far can you go on this thing? As far as is necessary. I mean, as far as is necessary. Milgram was very much aware that obedience is a necessary ingredient for society to function. But he focused on the darker side of obedience. Incorrect. 150 volts. Sad face. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. Now, this man makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now, other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. It's hair. 75 volts. <laughs> Please continue. Some psychologists were troubled by the ethics of it. Many, if not most, subjects found it a highly stressful, conflicted experience. People are stammering, stuttering, laughing hysterically and appropriately. 150 volts. Oh. Clearly, you know, when we say people went to the top of the shock board, it wasn't like they were going blithely, sadistically. People went stop and go, stop and go. They were in a state of conflict, which was created a tremendous amount of stress. So that was the main critique. This will be at 3.30. As his voice began to show increasing frustration, uh, so did I. And I was really in a state of uh, real conflict and agitation. One of Stanley Milgram's basic contributions was that you don't ask people what they would do given this hypothetical situation. You put them in the situation. Wrong. Please continue, teacher. 180 volts. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Stand it. I'm not going to kill that man. Yeah. According to Milgram, one of the things that's a prerequisite for carrying out acts that are evil is to shed responsibility from your shoulders and, and hand it over to the person in charge. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. He didn't hold any gun to anybody's head. Just the fact that he conveyed a sense of authority. Roughly 60, 65 percent of the people went all the way to the top of the shock board. 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Don't the man's help mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must. But he might be dead in there. Milgram made the point, I think, very effectively that the Nazis were all a bunch of psychopaths at Belsen and Dachau.
Suffered a death camp from the middle class in New Haven. Well, who's actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he's got to keep going. What kind of obedience would Milgram get today if he were to do the experiment today? Okay, I stopped that there, but it gives you an idea. Um, kind of chilling results, and I think the videos definitely um, give you a real sense out of you know just what happened and, and how it really did impact the people who were taking those tests when they learned um, you know what was actually going on. Your homework for tonight uh, is to do the handout that I provided. It's a PDF on Edsby, uh, which looks at the Solomon Ash uh, study. It's called the Line Experiment. We actually talked about that a little bit in class before, but you'll get to read about it a little bit more. It looks at conformity um, and group behavior. So take a look at that, do questions number one to five. Um, and for your next day, um, before you get there, I'll post some answers in terms of some of the things you should have been looking at. Um, yeah, okay, good luck.